So once fertilization has begun, then that zygote and the endosperm can go ahead and develop into an actual seed. So the first thing that's going to happen is the zygote is going to divide into two cells. And you can see the first cell is this terminal cell, and this is going to become the embryo, which is the vast majority of this. And this basal cell is going to become what's called the suspensor, um, which is going to be just this part down here that attaches the actual embryo to um, the seed and allows for transporting nutrients to the embryo. A seed needs three parts to be a seed. We need a plant embryo, so that you can see here is this. This is a dicotyledon, so you can see there's two co cotyledons here. There needs to be a seed coat. So you can see that the coat is the two integuments on the outside. The seed coat is diploid, but from the parent. So the 2N in the seed coat is actually the female parent ovary um, genetics. And then we need a food source. So this is the endosperm. And the endosperm gets absorbed into the cotyledons. Most dicots, the endosperm gets absorbed into the cotyledons and they swell up. And then monocots, the endosperm will go through the cotyledon to get to uh, the actual embryo. Here we've got some mature seeds. On the left we've got the dicot seeds, and on the right we've got monocot. And you're going to see that they both have some of the same structures, they're just organized differently. So here we've got a common garden bean, and then down here is um, a castor bean. So this is one where the cotyledons don't swell and the endosperm remains. But in most dicots, the cotyledons swell up to fill the entire space, and the endosperm is completely absorbed. So you can see one, two cotyledons there, one, two cotyledons there. The monocot only has one cotyledon, so that's right here, and it's also usually called the scutellum. And instead of swelling up, the endosperm is just de de absorbed through um, that cotyledon. They both have an embryo, so here's the embryo. Um, the epicotyl is going to become the shoot, and the hypocotyl is going to become the root, cotyl being cotyledon. So epi is above where they attach to the cotyledons, hypocotyl is below where it attaches to the cotyledon, um, and the radical here is that embryological root. So that's the very first thing that's going to um, emerge. So you can see the same things over here. We have the epicotyl above where it attaches to the cotyledon, the hypocotyl, and then that basic root, which is the radical. The monocot seeds also have a couple of structures called the coleoptile, which covers the um, developing shoots. So a lot of times this will puncture through the soil to provide a tube uh, for the shoot to grow out of, and the coleorhiza, which is going to also help to cover that um, initial root during germination to help protect the baby embryo of the plant. Seeds can remain dormant for a really long time. So a seed, when it becomes mature, is going to dehydrate down to about 5 to 15 percent of water, and it enters a stage called dormancy. And it stops growing, and at this point the metabolism of a seed is basically nothing. So it's not really using up its food sources, it's just waiting until it finds the right environment. And most seeds need water in a process called imbibition, where they will start to germinate. Um, but they also sometimes need additional environmental cues. So some things that need a lot of light, um, things like lettuce leaves, they tend to be buried shallow, and so they can use light from the surface to tell them when uh, it's going to be an appropriate time to germinate. Rainfall, so after a big rainfall, you might get seeds that are germinating because now we have an abundance of water. Um, this is also common after the winter ends. So after the winter ends, you're going to start to see spring, which has a lot of rain, and that's a good cue to the seeds that we've kind of exited winter and spring is a better time to germinate because you're not going to get um, frost, which is the same thing here, extreme cold. 
So some seeds require an extremely cold um, period of time before they can germinate. And this helps to ensure that they germinate at the end of winter or after winter is over. Uh, chemical breakdown, this is common in seeds that are transported by animals. So seeds that get eaten by animals, they go through the digestive system of the animal, that helps to break them down, and then they are excreted in a pile of feces, which is a wonderful environment for seeds to germinate because it's extremely nutritious for the seed. Some seeds uh, germinate after fire, so this is common in um, things like the longleaf pine forest in the Apalachicola National Forest, which is up in the panhandle of Florida. Uh, so the, the brush burns and creates a fire which signals seeds that are in the ground that it's okay to germinate. And this makes sense because that means that all of the brush around the seed is gone, and that seed is not going to have to compete with other plants for light, and it's going to find an environment where it's going to be able to get light. The oldest seed that we have um, that has germinated was a 2,000-year-old date palm. Most seeds don't get that old. Most seeds only last about one to two years. But the soil on the earth is full of ungerminated seeds. So if you've ever pulled weeds and then go back out a month later and it's completely full of weeds again, um, that's because there are seeds in the ground that are going to continue to germinate. So once the seed has decided that germination is going to happen based on the environment, um, imbibition is the f initial swelling with water. So this is why when we plant seeds, we water them um, because they are going to imbibe or drink the water. Um, and this is going to help to break the seed coat um, and allow for the seed to start growing the radical. So here we've got dicots on the left again and monocots on the right. And you can see that the first thing that happens in both is the little radical is going to grow out and become the root. The very first thing a brand new baby plant wants to do is to start absorbing nutrients and water right away. In a dicot, the um, stem is going to form a little U shape and it's going to pull the cotyledons out of the ground. And you'll notice that the cotyledons don't look like true leaves. Um, the cotyledons are the remains of that endosperm food source. So after that's used up, once we have our true leaves um, that are able to do photosynthesis, um, the cotyledons will shrivel, shrivel and fall off, and now we have a seedling. Uh, it's very similar, but a little different in the monocot. In the monocot, often the coleoptile will form like a tube, which will allow those true foliage leaves to emerge and start doing uh, photosynthesis. And you can see that these leaves, they form a sheath around the central stem um, rather than kind of coming off on these petioles. Fruits are super important in the distribution of seeds. So typically fruits are how seeds move around because they're going to attract a animal often to distribute them and move them to a new location, which is advantageous to a plant because plants can't go find new environments on their own. They have to rely on their seeds um, to go find new environments. So simple fruits are going to develop from a single or several fused carpels. So here we've got in the pea plant, we have the ovary is the pea pod and each ovule develops into a seed. An aggregate fruit is going to be one flower, but multiple carpels. So for example, a raspberry, each little ball of the raspberry comes from a different carpel, but it's all on the same flower. Um, multiple fruits develop from an inflorescence. So on a pineapple, the flowers, there's actually many flowers here. So each flower contributes to one section of the pineapple. And then accessory fruits are any other fruits that contain um, other parts of the flower. So for example, uh, the ovary of the apple is right here, but it actually contains part of the receptacle too, outside the fleshy part. And so the apple is called an accessory fruit because it contains more than just the ovary and the ovule. Most fruits 
um, ripen at about the same time that seeds complete their development. This is a huge advantage for plants because it means that the time that the fruit is going to be attracting animals is the same time that those seeds are going to be getting distributed by them.